All right, that was not a shameless promotion. That was uh, supposed to be a piece about uh, growing up in South Africa, uh, which I did, and uh, growing up in a, a very racially divided South Africa, and um, not really being able to process that as a kid, not really knowing what that meant or the, the weight and the enormity of what that meant growing up as a kid. It really took me sort of stepping out of South Africa, uh, getting to college, going to college to begin to process the, the complex racial, economic, political issues that were uh, part of my growing up years in South Africa. And when I get to college, um, I'm, I'm learning a lot like you are about the complexity of the world and how to parse it out, how to analyze it, how to, you know, with, with social science maybe to understand more of the patterns in the world. Um, and so I teach cultural anthropology today in part out of that upbringing. Um, and yet, it was in college that I started to meet the Jesus who we just heard from that, and that Natalie read for us, the Jesus who has come to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and to declare the year of Jubilee. Jubilee, when the, when the slaves would be set free and the land would be redistributed and, 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 and things would be set so that none would go without, right? And started to think about, well, what does it mean to follow that Jesus? What does it mean to be called by that Jesus into the world? And uh, the whole image of being in the hands and feet of Jesus takes on a whole new meaning when you think about Jesus who brings good news to the poor and release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed. And to declare a reorientation of the way we interact with one another economically and politically. And so uh, George asked us if we, would, if we would, on this MLK weekend, just reflect a little bit out loud. Because after college, then, it became a family calling. And my wife, Michelle, is sitting down here. You can say, hi, Michelle. She's sitting right down here. She's amazing. She's a little sore that she's not a part of this today. So um, I can shout, giving her a shout out. But um, so I get the privilege. I told George, I said, why don't I interview Carissa and Anthony, your peers? here at school and see what kind of damage we did over the years. Uh, I mean, what kind of uh, uh, life we lived together trying to live out loud God's calling, Jesus' is calling to justice, not just in-house, in the family, but kind of out on the streets too. So that's, we're just gonna share a couple stories today. One of the things that uh, I learned in college, and then I'm, I'm gonna let them talk the rest of the time here, one of the, I, I met so many good people while I was in college, like Tony Campolo, you might have heard of him before. He, he asked us in college, though, like he asked poignant, practical questions. Should Christians, and he was, he was talking to middle class Christians, he said, and upper class Christians, he said, should Christians drive a BMW, a luxury car? And it started to got, get us thinking about class and Christianity. Um, I remember Ray Bakke came. And he, he witnessed to his family who, he took his whole family, little kids and all, and lived in some of the projects in Chicago, lived out their ministry and life embedded in that neighborhood. And I remember John Perkins and Wayne Gordon, uh, who, who started, they were, they were pastors in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi. And in Jackson, Mississippi, they, they, uh, Wayne was pastor of a, a, an all-white congregation, and, and John Perkins was pastor of an all-black congregation in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and this back in the 70s even. Um, and they began to cross that border and bring their churches together, and that bringing those churches together began to get other churches to pay attention to bridging the racial divide with church itself. And they started an organization called the CCDA, the, Christ, the, the Christian Community Development Association. I got to know them. And the three principles of the CCDA were, look, if we're going to be Christian and live out loud with our congregations and our households, then maybe, and they used the three R's, they said maybe the reconciliation we seek should also involve two other R's, relocating and redistributing. So literally with your body, with your families, with your church, relocating into those spaces that Shane Cleborn calls the abandoned places of empire, to the, the places that other people aren't paying as much attention to or that your people aren't paying enough attention to. That's the relocation. And then the redistribution is live simply that others can simply live. Like live with less and live in a way open-handed so that others are also living uh, well. And so we try to weave that into our family and weave that into our life together. And for us, that meant moving to San Diego. When we found a house, we'd have to find a neighborhood where we could embed ourselves and figure it out from there. And I'm not going to say we've done it well or uh, we've got, we're going to talk about some of the things we've done not so well. Um, but we bumbled our way through it by, we moved into National City. National City, about 58,000 people. Um, and a city that, well, 8%, 7% 
white families. So we are in the minority, mostly uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, and uh, then also Filipino, strong Filipino. We have a Jollibees in that neighborhood, if you know what that is. Um, and so we moved into the neighborhood, and we're just gonna tell you about, kind of from there, just kind of trying to figure it out a bit. So, Chris, Anthony, we move into National City. You're young, right? We move into National City when you're really young. Do you, what are some of the memories you have of moving into National City? Um, so definitely one of the things that I remember most clearly about our first move in there, I was eight, um, there were these big, thick metal bars on our windows. Our neighbors had them on either side, um, and as soon as we got in, uh, you and mom took to unscrewing everything, pulling them off, breaking the bars when you had to, um, and Anthony and I asked you both why we would do that, like, what's, why are we doing that? I mean, they're kind of ugly, but um, I remember a clear conversation about choosing to live against fear. So choosing to reject fear and taking these bars off and choosing to live, again, open-handed, even in this simple symbol of no bars on our windows. So we gave those bars to the neighbor, and uh, <laughs> I think he sold them for scrap. <laughs> That's what happened. So um, I didn't really understand um, why the bars were there when I was, because I was, I was really young, and um, it was really difficult to understand this thought of having to fear our neighborhood, because so frequently I found myself um, at the elementary school I went to, at my friend Francisco's house, who um, I didn't realize, but was a three-generational, um, it was a three-generational home. His grandparents lived with them, his mom and him. Um, along with his brothers and sisters. Um, and I, I so frequently found myself at their house not realizing that that was the predominant um, family type of our neighborhood, where it was a multi-generational family. Um, so it, it was really difficult to find myself thinking about fear when I'm spending so much time with my friends who are, un unbeknownst to me at the time, a part of that neighborhood so well. And, and Francisco's house is just uh, a friend and, and, and kind of living it out from there. Um, you, we put you in local schools, um, in, in the, the elementary schools in a National City and then in, in Hilltop Middle and High School in Chula Vista, not far from our house. What memories do you have from, from school and from just living out the way we're trying to? Yeah, so personally for me, starting in elementary school, I actually had a pretty hard time um, trying to integrate into a community where I wasn't a part of their culture because I was un, unfamiliar with um, foods, um, unfamiliar with TV shows that everybody watched, and it was really hard for me to kind of integrate into friendship circles where I didn't know what they were talking about. And it was even more difficult for me to find other people who knew what I was talking about when I was talking about like TV shows and my, my culture because there's so few people who really And you understand. had a particular hard time at, at your first elementary school, right? Yeah, I actually, um, I had to move schools from fifth to sixth grade because um, I was actually getting physically bullied by a couple guys because I was this small, annoying white kid in the class. <laughs> you were probably getting bullied as much because you were annoying as any of those other factors, right? <laughs> it's definitely true. Well, let's be real. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just... Like, you moved to another school of a similar racial background, um, just right next to our house. Had a fantastic experience there. Um, but one of the things I remember clearly is a different story. Um, I actually had a pretty easy time making friendships and relationships, but it was more because I came in and noticed the ways that I was different and the ways that my friends were trying to make spaces for me to be comfortable. Um, so I decided that I was going to learn Spanish because I couldn't communicate with some of my friends' moms. Um, so a lot of it was so that my friends didn't have to make a separate environment for me to fit in. And also, para comprender cuando los madres me hacen burla. Um, but, yeah, it was a different experience for sure. Um, you didn't understand that so she could uh, understand the... Uh... When moms made fun of me, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that actually happened a lot. <laughs> Um, so, um, just not just at school and in your friendship circles, but how about dating life? Yeah. Which of you have some stories from dating life we were talking about? So, uh, my sophomore year of high school, Cesar came up to me and asked me on a date. I told him no, and he said, that's okay, I don't think you would say yes, you only date white guys. And I argued, right? So I argued, I was like, hold on, I actually haven't dated anybody yet. Um, 
but it's kind of it's kind of interesting looking at my actual history now, um, where all four of the guys who I've dated have been um, white, and except for Joseph Chang in the first grade, but like that doesn't really count. <laughs> so. and, and what's funny is, as hard as I found it found it um, integrating into. Um, different cultures. I actually find myself now in a long-term year-and-a-half relationship with a girl who is um, half Korean and half Mexican, and it, that's it, it's going quite wonderfully. So I, I don't know what, what's wrong with her. How, how wonderfully? No, no, no. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah. Not, not that. Too, too much information. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> so, one of my clear, like, very racialized memories in high school. That was a painful one to watch, but also extremely growing. Um, for me to see and know. I was on a basketball team in high school all four years I played, um, and my sophomore year, we went to, so we're, I went to high school, Chula Vista, um, predominantly Hispanic. All of the girls on my team were Hispanic except for me and one other girl. We went to this school in East County that is predominantly in an area, predominantly white, upper class, mid, upper middle class, um, and the tradition before basketball games is your team captains go shake the other team captain's hands, right? So their two team captains, whole team was white, um, came up to our two team captains before, supposed to shake hands, told them that they would not shake their hands um, because they were both Mexican. Uh, threw some slurs out during that game. There actually ended up being a fight between our team and their team during that game. Um, but that was a very clear memory for me. We. Uh we tried to live out the year of Jubilee for a few years by inviting another family to come and live with us. Um, and if they'll throw the picture up there, they called us La Casa Loca because we had so many little kids running around the house at the same time, or 10 of us in the household at the same time, trying to live simply as a family, uh, budgeting together, living Christ together, and then also living it out in the community. And sometimes we would live it out very publicly by taking our whole 10 person family out into the streets. What are some of the memories you have from the life we've tried to live justice out on the streets. So when I was nine, um, our families decided to go actively participate um, in our neighborhood as um, just as, as a family who sought that kind of th thing out. And so we actually ended up taking a walk to our, the main boulevard, National City Boulevard in our neighborhood, where there was a protest going on. This was the year that our mayor in National City had declared National City a sanctuary city. So. On one side, on the side that we were standing on, we had all the supporters, all the people who wanted this to happen for the, um, for the safety of everybody. Um, on the opposite side of the street, we had these um, people who were protesting, who thought that this was going to just bring our city down, that it was, it was gonna be um, negative towards our city growth. Um, we were separated by these rows of armed policemen um, on horses, in their vehicles, and it was, it was a very scary situation because they're all on it. Like they, I, I, I'm pretty sure they had rubber bullets, and I, I just as a nine-year-old, they were very they were armed, had shields, very all the all the armaments out. Chris yeah, I, I remember being really scared. They were all on horses, um, so riding horses around, very tall. <laughs> Um, we had strollers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had strollers in the but middle of this. It was a really interesting experience. Come to find out later, um, the police were there to keep peace, right? So that was unclear sometimes what that meant for everyone. Um, but come to find out later, the police were standing with the mayor and saying, when we make our city a sanctuary city, all these family members who have undocumented family members coming to visit, um, it's more of an issue of like when somebody who is undocumented is abused or someone commits a crime against them, they can come to the police safely and have protection rather than an under the radar um, crime. Have to live under the radar, right? Yeah. Uh, I remember it being really tense. Very, the horses were like bigger than any horses I've ever seen. And then I'm carrying Anthony, I think, on my shoulders. Yeah, and uh, so I, I, I was nine. <laughs> um, I was sitting on my dad's shoulders and you know those sandwich bags? Yeah, I, I kind of blew it up, and when, when you kind of smack it, it makes this really loud, like, bang. I thought it'd be hilarious to do that, so I, I did it, and my dad didn't I find said, it so funny. thanks, Anthony. It's, it's time to go now. <laughs> we, we had to leave early in that, in that particular time. <clears throat> 
There's, there's uh, one other, as we were preparing and thinking and, and praying about what we should share today, there's one other uh, event that stuck out in your memories as I'm just uh, asking you what really sticks out. Um, and Carissa, you had wanted to yeah. mention something. So um, one of the things I remember really strongly as well um, is the day that they stopped letting us serve communion across the border fence. Um, so we have a video up. I don't know if we have sound. Well, let me set this up a second. Um, the... Um, for years, decades actually, the service, across border service has been happening down where the border meets the ocean. Some of you have been with us to La Posada Sin Fronteras at uh, uh, Christmas time. And we had been serving communion through the border and then the border patrol was cool with it. There was just a single fence there. And this was back when just as they were ready to shut down the, the, anybody meeting there because they wanted to build another fence, they were gonna stop us from being able to serve, continue to serve communion. And so we planned a big choir celebration. And you'll see in this, in this footage, uh, uh, Keith, Dr. Keith Peterson uh, leading the choir and, and uh, Dr. Craig Johnson singing with his big baritone. And well, let's just show it to you and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Okay, that's enough for now. And I don't know if you could hear that. They were, we were singing. It was awfully soft, huh? It was really loud when we were there, I promise you. Um, and especially Craig Johnson, if you're here today, he was really loud. But because he was singing, he was singing actually as the baritone on the south side, and there was a, 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 an opera, a, a, a soprano from the Tijuana Opera on, on the Mexican side who joined him to sing Fares Requiem, which, which was this mournful dirge to lament the, our inability to be reconciled to one another given the walls between us. And yet we had some uninvited guests. So um, I was also pretty young at this point. Um, I don't remember what exact age I was, but um, these... You were 12. 12, okay, so I was about 12. <laughs> <laughs> and um, about. I, I, I remember having gone to these things multiple times. It's, it was a very peaceful and loving time where we got to pass candy through the fence. We would... Sometimes they would throw teddy bears over it. Was, it was all very, a, a very community-oriented thing. But for this specific instance, there were these, this group of Minutemen, um, self-proclaimed Minutemen, who came and as we were praying and singing our songs um, with their bullhorns or shouting um, obscenities and just things that, that were just derogatory towards um, immigrant families and the things that um, they've, tr they've tried to do. Um, I, I, as a 12-year-old, I didn't really understand why, um, why they're there. I understood prayer and songs to be a time, of, a time of love, a time of... And we were serving communion, right? Yeah, and what's funny was they're, they're, they're shouting this, why are you using tortillas? Use real bread, as if Jesus used Wonder Bread. <laughs> so... Uh, so it was, it became super tense and the Minutemen were sort of crouch, crouching in on the, on the communion service and on the, on the choir that was singing on both sides of the border. There's a, a phalanx of border patrol preventing us from going up to the border fence to be able to serve through the, through the fence. Chrissy, you have some yeah, thoughts? Yeah, so one of the things that this group of Minutemen kept doing was they were trying to walk into the choir um, and one of them just kept knocking over Dr. Peterson's um, music stand, so he had to keep picking it up as he was trying to, to direct the choir, just kept knocking it over, pick it up, knock it over, pick it up, shouting in his ear with a bullhorn as he's trying to hear the music and direct. Um, but then these three, these three activists who were active in the 60s came up, there was, one of them was La Abuelita, came up and linked arms in front of Dr. Peterson and then just very slowly and peacefully walked backwards, um, stood as a barrier between um, Dr. Peterson and the men with the bullhorns, um, and yeah, yeah, that's just and miraculously they 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 abided by and respected that barrier of of old people. <laughs> it was beautiful. So it was beautiful, and and um, it was a little more tense in that um, 
the Pastor John Fanestel and I were co-officiating, and Pastor John, we had arranged ahead of time that we'd need to finish the communion service because we'd only served communion on the U.S. side. And as an, uh, as an act of finishing the service, Pastor John was to walk to the fence, and the Border Patrol said no. And so it became an act of civil disobedience to take a step forward to serve communion. And they detained him. They arrested him. On our walk back, I remember Chris is just like, if you know Carissa, she thinks out loud, and uh, and and she, we were just processing. Both of us like to process out loud, and we were processing so much. I asked her when we got uh, on our way back if, if when she got home, um, if she would if she would just pencil out something that was expressing what she was thinking and feeling. What did you draw here? So this is my very embarrassing 13-year-old drawing, um, but my perception of the time. So it's I drew a cathedral. Um, with a fence splitting right through the communion table, splitting the body and the blood of Jesus. Um, for me, that event was very symbolic of um, a tie being broken, a family and a body being broken um, by this, even just a simple thing as a wall. And if we rethink that whole space as all of that is God's parish, it makes us think differently about how to engage in the world, no matter what your politics are. Um, we're, uh, we have constantly tried to at least just put you guys with us wherever we go, and I don't always know if you process it well or not. Um, I don't always know if it's, it's, uh, it's something that you will want to do with your life in the future, but at least I know that it's shaped you as you're coming into Point Loma, right? So that life of growing up, trying to live life with justice out loud, and coming to Point Loma, what are some of the thoughts you had in these last few minutes we have to transition to Point Loma? So one thing I've noticed, and all of my friends from high school and everything I've noticed is this is one of the most homogeneous um, situations I've been in, where the school is predominantly um, Caucasian, um, where I don't experience the culture differences as much as I have before. And I'm not saying that, that, that that's not a bad thing at all, it's just different. And so what I've experienced coming into this school is love and compassion and a, a need and a, and a want for this school to seek out those who aren't a part of this community. And I think that I've, I've really enjoyed the fact that this school doesn't, it doesn't stop when it, where they think that it is appropriate to. They always want to push boundaries because that's what we are called to do as, as the followers of Christ. Um, that's my baby sister, by the way. She's cute. Um, She's actually passing contraband through the border. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so coming to Point Loma, um, choosing to try and seek Jesus and be formed and molded into the shape of his hands and feet um, as I've come and talked with friends who struggle with being the other or who struggle to love and include the other, um, I want to leave all of you from us. This message of Jesus' love for you has so overflowed. Um, and that's why we choose to live in response to that love. We choose to live in a way that invites the stranger, that loves the neighbor, um, that welcomes all in. And that means sacrificing your comfort sometimes. Um, that means sacrificing your convenience. It means stepping out of the places that make you feel safe. Um, and you'll find again and again that you become safe and you grow. Um, but this life of Jesus is a continual growth. If I could give a quick witness at the end of this communion service, we invited the Border Patrol and the Minutemen to join us for communion. They chose not to. Um, but on our walk back, I was listening as Chris and I were walking together, and two of the Minutemen were talking to each other, and one angrily talking to the other about his sister and how this liberty belief immigrant uh, did to his sister. And I heard where this anger was coming from. I heard where this fear was coming from. And the Jesus that calls us to love cross boundaries and love our enemies meant that the Minutemen were to be loved as much as everyone else in that situation. And that was like, <laughs> So we, we, we're, we're uh, at a place where we're just going to wrap up. And I think given that it's MLK weekend, Anthony has a, an MLK quote we want to leave you with. 
and uh, Chris is going to pray us out. So this quote was actually from uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s last uh, last time in San Diego, and actually the words he spoke at this campus, if you have ever listened to that podium in the gym, um, you would have heard these words. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of the dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes the ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we're going to pray. Um, would you actually stand up with me as we pray? Father, we give you our lives. Um, and whatever that means, Lord, would you shape us? Um, would you help us to live as we sang this morning, pouring our affection and our devotion out on your feet? Would that be a lifestyle that we walk would we um, live a gospel that brings good news to the poor, that causes oppression to cease, that brings sight to the blind? Um, may we be agents of your kingdom in ways that challenge us, in ways that push us out of our comfort zone. Would we be agents of your love and of your grace for the oppressed and the oppressor, God? Would our words and our actions bring reconciliation and healing and a restoration that we see in your resurrection? We love you. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>